This series of videos retraces the life of Mary Rabagliati. In the previous video, she left her native England at age 20 to work with Father Joseph Brzezinski in an emergency camp for homeless families in France. As a British citizen in France, I needed a visa, so I declared that I was working as a housemaid. But Father Joseph called us community helpers. We were there day and night during weekends and all week long, but with regular hours for our work, just as any workers have. That regular rhythm of life had so often been missing for people living in deep poverty. When you're never sure at what time you might be able to eat or how you'll be able to provide a meal, but school hours are regular. So we'd start at 8 a.m. every day and always finish at the same time in the evening. When the children went to school, by the time they got there, their shoes were caked with mud. They used to hide their muddy shoes on the side of the road and put on clean shoes because otherwise they got into trouble with the teachers and other students for arriving in such a dirty state. Children do like walking in the mud, but they also like to be warm sometimes and to have dry feet. The water in the camp was cold and you had to go outside and walk several hundred yards in the mud and bring back the water. It was very hard and many people's homes were in very bad state. And so were the children and so were their clothes. Yet the children were expected to go to school and when they appeared in dirty or ragged clothes, obviously they were treated as though they were no good children and their parents were no good. So everything was done to try to make it possible for the families to live with some kind of beauty around them. To have the things that they needed in order to live decently, Father Joseph had started by building a nursery school and a library and a chapel. These buildings, they weren't palaces, but they were certainly a change to the rest of the camp. These were places where he wanted people's minds to be opened, to give them a chance to think and to do things that would enable them to express themselves to others. The women's centre was a beautiful room. It had washing machines. It was like any laundrette, a place where people talk to each other. You're out there scrubbing all the stuff, talking to each other. I got to know a lot of the mothers and I saw how hard it was. Very often, the young girls would come in and do the family washing and I understood what a hard life they had. Having to take responsibilities for their families, the elder daughters were often working very, very hard. Even all living in those conditions, there are the clean people and the so-called dirty people. Some people came with beautiful white sheets and clean clothes, and some came with filthy, dirty sheets and dirty clothes crawling with bugs and lice. I was told that the laundry should have a place of honour for the women and the young girls with the dirtiest sheets and with all the bugs. Not just that, they should be allowed in where nobody else was there. It was not that they should be there instead of the other, but that they should be respected just as much as the others. And as you can imagine, some of the clean people thought they were better organised. It was true that to keep clean, they really had to struggle, and they worked and worked. But it wasn't easy for the cleanest families to agree that their laundry should be washed in the same machines, and that they should share a room with those who had the dirtiest washing. This is what ATD was about right from the beginning, that we should welcome the most and judge the least those who have the most difficult time, because they are judged by everybody. On occasion, one or two of the women would get to gossiping about another one, and I couldn't find a way to stop them. Fortunately, this only happened once or twice. The most important thing there was to show each woman, the pleasure we had when she was present. Each of them needed to know that none of the others were any better than she was or had any more rights. That might seem obvious, but in fact, it's terribly easy to give the impression of favoritism without meaning to. It is a hundred times easier to lose trust than to win it back. Even if people make a joke of it, it's a real problem. Problem. This is why I tried not to have too many women using the laundry at the same time, to be able to give real attention to each one. But I also tried to make sure that as many women as possible could use the laundry regularly, instead of having the same group monopolise the place. I didn't really manage that, but I could have done worse. 
In fact, at first, some of the poorest women in the camp were earning money by doing the washing for others who were better off. So the laundry had a rule. You could only come to wash your own laundry so that everyone could get to know each other there. And you wouldn't have some treating the others like slaves. And we started a different project where women who needed to earn money could do so by opening a workshop for the 3M Scotch Tape Company. That idea of creating a joyful atmosphere was something all the volunteers were meant to do throughout the camp. We did manage to have joyful times together and ordinary times, but there were also times of despair and violence. There were families who never came out of doors. It was very important for us to meet them in order to know what they were suffering. They live a terrible life. There were other families who were constantly fighting. Everybody argues, especially when life is difficult. It doesn't throw people together. It throws people to argue against each other. Once they called me out in the middle of the night, because a man was destroying his own home with an axe. This man had spent the previous months doing everything he could to try to fix the place up, to make it a home his family could be proud of. And suddenly one night he gave up and just smashed everything. To smash something in your house is a sign of somebody in great distress. When you couldn't do anything else, you couldn't protest, you had to break everything up. So his neighbors came to get me, but at the same time, they said to me, don't go near him, maybe he will hurt you. But no one dared go up to him, so I finally did, and we ended up sitting down together to talk. There wasn't anything I could do for him, except maybe just to be there at the right moment. That night was so hard for his neighbours. They couldn't bear seeing him destroy his own home. That's why they called me. Our presence there as volunteers meant that we could be there when life was impossible. There was nothing much we could do, except to be witnesses, and to make sure people didn't destroy everyone around them. It was a rotten place with a bad reputation, but we built this fantastic youth club with the help of summer volunteers. The youth movement of ATD started with an English volunteer, taking cars to bits and he did it with the young people and they were learning through it. There was no refuse collector, so what they did was to go around pushing the dust cart to collect people's dustbins and charge them a few centimes for each bin. Collecting rubbish was a way for them to do something useful on a Saturday afternoon. But it was a community project as well. And the youth club they built was beautiful. It had a dance band and everything. It was the time when bands were starting and all the local kids came to it. It was the best club in the area. It immediately changed the idea of the area. The idea that there was nothing any good. It looked the best and it was the best. They had the best dance on a Saturday night. It gave a completely new image to the young people and what they had to offer. They were very proud of it and obviously this way they met other young people. Father Joseph was a profoundly joyful man. He said the most important thing for the volunteer corps was to be happy. You cannot liberate the poor while you are sad. He had learned that from the poorest people. Somehow people who are deprived of everything are able to be creative and maintain a joie de vivre. When they realise they can change something. As soon as you know that you are capable of changing something, even when things are at their worst, you can overcome sadness. At the end of every day, Father Joseph had us volunteers write reports. He insisted that our presence there must make a difference. Not by being nice to people and then going back to our own lives, but by building a secretariat to study and to build thinking about extreme poverty. The principle was the fact that the families living there had something to say to other people about their conditions. Instead of others judging them and deciding why they were like they were, what was needed was to enable families to tell us what their experience was and what they wanted from life. This is where the research aspect of ATD comes in. Right from the beginning, people were writing. Writing each night, I got so much out of that for myself. By reliving the day, I would hear again what people had said to me. Even if what I wrote was foolish because I hardly knew people, writing became such an important way for me to listen to everyone around me. To listen to the person who I hadn't really paid attention to during the day. To think again about what they said. Writing every night was a way to develop in each of us a spirit of inquiry. Not just to sit alone writing at night, but to be interested and in asking questions during the day. To get to know people better. As volunteers, we had no lessons to teach. What we could do was communicate through our way of living. Getting up every day, getting dressed respectably. Father Joseph used to demand that, that our hair ought to be combed properly. 
He'd say, if you want to look a mess, you can go back home. But here, in the middle of such miserable poverty, you should look beautiful and handsome so that people are glad to see you. At the same time, he stuck up for us so that families in the camp would understand that we had made a choice to join them and were paying a price for it. The way we presented ourselves was a way of showing families around us the respect we had for them, which we showed in the way we presented ourselves. It's not a word we used at the time, but I think it was about dignity, building a sense of community and living with dignity so that the families in the camp could each build their own sense of dignity. In the middle of this filth and human misery, we had to fight for the hope of dignity. This has been the third video in the series, Fighting for the Hope of Dignity, Drawing Mary Rabagliati's Life. In the next video, Mary travels to the front lines of the US war on poverty.